just hydraulic door opener. I can honestly say I have never seen one of those. And with this picture, I <coughs> assume, bless you. Thank you. I'm gonna assume, and if one of you guys want to look this up, that'd be awesome too. But I'm gonna assume that it's gonna go in between the door and the jam itself, and then hydraulically push the door open. I again, I've never seen one. It's a small picture. Uh, if we get a chance, we'll look that up. Uh, and if that is the case on how they work, I think we'd like to get them for our department too. That's a pretty neat little idea. Uh, the guy using the hydraulic ram, what he's got is he is separating out this door jam. He's going to spread this door jam a bit. He's got it right here below the locking mechanism and on the other side of the jam. He's just separating out the jam just enough to be able to push that pin through and open the door. Um, majority of the doors, when your jam is built in there, it's not pressed directly against the framing. There is some gap in there, uh, especially on your residential ones with your uh, wood, wood frame doors. You get a lot of bend and bow out of those. You can actually bend and bow those enough where you can just push the door open, release your hydraulic jam, and the, the wood will come right back into place, the trim does. Now these metal doors, they could be concrete reinforced, don't know, but you still can, you're, all, you're almost always guaranteed to get a little bit of play out of there. And you just need enough gapping in there to where you can take a shove knife or something and, and, and release that locking mechanism, that, that pin in there. Uh, hydraulic rams, we actually use those, we use what's called a, a W tool, it's a manual hydraulic jam, uh, hydraulic ram uh, for making entry in the doors. Of course, we have the hydraulic ram on our trucks for extrication and such. Pushing and pulling tool. Uh, I think that's a misprint. The first rubbish hook is clearly a New York hook. Uh, but we have various pipe poles and links and shorter ones with D-handles. The drywall hook, which you can hook onto, push through a wall, hook onto it, and you can actually start pulling drywall down like that with these claws. The San Francisco hook, neat little thing, never been to San Francisco, not sure what it's used for. But the pipe poles. So a lot of times, the only reason why we use, we'll use a pipe pole uh, will be our longer ones. It's when we cut a hole in a roof and we'll stick a pipe pole down through there to bust out the ceiling to actually ventilate the fire itself over the, over the seat of the fire. Uh, some guy came up with a New York hook, and I think it's a super versatile uh, hook. I actually prefer it to the pipe pole. Um, again, I'm a smaller dude, so I don't have that big old handle on it. Uh, I like the way that this is actually shaped. I can pop trim with it. I can pull ceiling with it. I can pull walls with it. I'm pretty sure that Halligan, the guy, uh, Captain Halligan from New York, made the Halligan tool and the New York hook, too. Oh, he's the one that made the New York hook. He, he made that New York hook, So, too. fun fact about your Halligan. Yeah. Uh, that, Mr. Halligan there, he did make that tool. Yep. Um, but he designed that tool after um, a slew of bank robbers. Robbers. Um, so they were criminals are just as smart as the people that are prosecuting them. Uh, it's just a cat and mouse game with the good and the bad. They were taking these and they were busting into bank safes and vaults with these. Mm -hmm. And nobody could figure out how they were getting into them because they're such secure vaults. And then I can't remember if they got caught or if one was left behind. But either way, they, they got a hold of the guy's tool. The, the guy got was just left behind. So he was left behind on accident. Uh, police and fire showed up, find his tool. They're like, what the heck is this freaking thing? And they just commenced to put it to use. Right. And well, find it. it's one of the best <laughs> tools to ever get the fire service, man. We, we can go through, open up, close up, save ourselves a lot with this Um Just the design itself that marries right in with, your, with the ax that you're going to use it with. It's just an amazing tool. I, don't, I, I can't even tell you all the uses that can be done with this. I can tell you 10 out of 100. Uh, and then you'll meet somebody in six weeks that says, oh, I've got 50 more uses for that. Just an amazing tool. The rubber shows, we do actually carry one of those. Um, we'll find great when we get our trash fires and our dumpster fires, we pull them out with that. that that's a great little tool also. Uh, the pipe poles, those are the original. You're gonna, uh, that, Pull it top and push it through your sheetrock and hook down. You're, you're hooking it down. You also use that for uh, pulling because it's rigid at the end, just like these. 
I don't have a tight pole in here. But again, it's got a hook shape on it. So if you need to reach up and pull something, you can. And it's actually very rigid and durable. Uh, no idea about tank zip though. Mm -hmm. Neat little contraption though. Never been there. Striking tools. So you have your sledgehammers, your regular hammers, claw hammers, mallets. A lot of times those mallets are either going to be metal, uh, wood or rubber. Your chisel, pickaxe, flathead axe, SWAT team battering ram. That's a neat little weapon. And then a ball. A ball is basically just like a, a four or an eight pound sledgehammer. A small, small sledgehammer. Uh, sure would like to try one of those battering rams one of those. That punch is a spring loaded job. You will push it back in, like you put it into a corner of a window down low. Uh, you push it in. This will actually go in, hit a mechanism there that spring loads it right back out and then will actually toggle the whole window out. And then you can take it, put it after some ash, put it after some raining, and make entries into your car and your window, whatever you're going to use, uh, whatever you use for it. More than likely, you're going to use that on a car window because of the tempered glass. Uh, your pick head axe, or your pick, um, that's going to be a double sided pick. So there's probably going to be a different angle and a point on each of those, or they could very well be the same. Uh, those you've been using for making small trenches, you're going to dig out little small areas and break, break for all, uh, debris away with those. Uh, rocks, dirt, stuff like that. Um, you're not going to want to slam that into a wall and try to pry pry it open or anything like that. Uh, the flathead axe. Of course it's an axe, but the back part is flat. So these weigh in, you know, a few pounds a piece, which is probably a, a four or six pound job, hardened steel. It's virtually the same as a sledgehammer. It's got a little bit less mass to it, so it's not going to do quite as much damage to the object that you're striking it on. Uh, but it has the axe side to it, so it gives you another option to use that for. Just another tool in the toolbox, if you will. Um, chisel. So with the chisel, you're going to use a hammer. This is for knocking out small pieces of uh, concrete, to, like those those rebar windows. You can use that chisel to rebar to chunk chunk out the concrete that was on the one that the uh, rebar was offset from the uh, the window itself. Uh, that'd be a that'd be a way you'd be able to get around going going. Uh, getting into that window per se as opposed to bringing out your, your quickie saw or getting that uh, torch or whatever over there strung out across the, uh, the road to the, the yard to get to it. Well, and then of course the hammer, that's a carpenter's friend. You're going to pull nails and you're going to set nails with it. It's a hammer so you can use it to rub things. It's not going to be rubbed a lot. It's a nail puller and a nail driver for the part. Tools used in combination. So, in the fire service, we're going to call them our irons. So it's going to be a married set. Um, I, I said just a few minutes ago how the kind of thing we were talking about when the guy designed it and all the reasons behind it. This one isn't for it, but it fits perfectly together. And they call that a they call that your irons. This is a married set of irons. Nine times out of ten. They're going to be strapped together and carried together, so one person has to carry this instead of, I'll carry the axe, you carry the halogen. Now I have them both. I can make my way to that door. I can start forcing that door while you're getting your mask set up, while you're getting your hose stretched out, whatever. And then you come there and you can finish get, uh, forcing the door with me, or I'll already have it forced and we're ready to go in. Um, and I've maintained control of the door itself. Obviously, it's two tools. Maintain control of the door is going to stop on our ventilation as you kick it open. Uh, Those two are so commonly used together that even if they're not married together in your compartment, they're going to be right next to each other for most of the time. So those are they're together. You can take those together. Uh, very seldom do you see somebody who has a halogen in their belt or a flathead in their belt whose partner doesn't have the other one. Um, occasionally you'll get somebody who's just like me and that's their favorite tool. So I'm going to bring that. Uh, for, for second, third, fourth in, I'm not even going to touch the halogen. I'm going straight for a New York hook because I want the fun stuff done and I'm about to pull ceiling and walls. Um, but 
you're one of the first couple people there, I'm, I'm gonna have a howling on me. I, that's, that's my stuff. I'm hoping that somebody has a flathead with me, my partner. If not, I'm gonna have both. Uh, love that howling. What five of the tools most commonly used for forceful entry? You guys remember any of those? Oh, you just mentioned that. Iron there. Iron? Um, saw. What, what's that? Saw. Saw. Ram. Mm -hmm. uh, Matchbox. And you know, your cutters, depending on you have what cutters. you're cutting and everything. You have hydraulic. Yeah. You have electric. Mm -hmm. Manual. Gas. Um, let's explain the consideration for forceful entry tool safety. Uh, so, tool safety starts when you get off the truck. There's proper ways to carry a tool, and there's improper ways to carry a tool. You could you never run on a fire scene, but we almost always trip and fall. When you trip and fall, you don't want to be <coughs> tripping and falling like this. Uh, there's certain ways to carry each tool. It's safe for you, it's safe for the people around you, and it's safe for the environment, uh, the people around you. So, you're going to carry with the danger down. You're going to carry it like this, or you're going to carry it like this. Either way, your danger's down. They're going to teach you that, but when you get to the fire scene, you're going to take this and you're going to throw it in your belt like that, and you're going to go to work. Uh, again, each tool that you carry is going to be carried in a different manner. If I'm not mistaken, I believe they actually want you to carry a, an axe like this, so you're actually protecting the, the head underneath your arm and stuff like that. Uh, <coughs> Refer to your manufacturers. They'll tell you what's what's a safe way to carry that tool, how you're supposed to use that tool, and what you're supposed to use that tool with. Refer to that at all times. That means use it for what you're going to use it for. But always refer to that manufacturer. <laughs> you're going to use it for what you're using it for. Um, the more you practice with your tool, the more the better technique you're going to have. Uh, and, I, and with that technique is going to come with your safety. You're going to be a lot safer using your tools with your safety equipment on. And the 30th time you've used uh, a halogen, it's going to be so much smoother and so much safer than the first time you've used your halogen. It's muscle memory and just learning those tools itself. Improper use of tools. It can result in strains, sprains, fractures, abrasions, and lacerations. Again, that's going to be with your sharp edges, your pinch points, your shrapnel coming off. Uh, if you're not wearing gloves and you're, you're using a tool too close to something sharp, it may not be the tool or the material that you're trying to cut. It could just be something that you've brushed against. So, and, and, and cut yourself on that. Give yourself an abrasion on that. Uh, always use your PPE. Again, it may not be the tool. It may not be you. It may not be the material. It could be what's around you. That, that get you. So cover your bases and cover yourself. Presented injuries when using tools. Super important apparently. It's on there again. Wear appropriate PPE. Hands, gloves, eye protection, ear protection. And your fire helmet because it looks cool. Only use undamaged tools. So one of the most dangerous tools you have in your toolbox is a dull tool is a broken tool. Uh, tools are designed and shaped and sharpened by the manufacturers to a certain point so that they can operate to their, to their uh, fullest capability. Uh, say we've tried cutting a bunch of that rebar that we talked about with these. If that rebar is a lot more hard than steel, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it's going to start doling this out. It could even start putting little indentions in there. Once those indentions get in there and dulls it out, you close it down, you can see that even these still being in good shape, you can still kind of see through there. There's some there's spots where you've hit some harder metal and they don't actually go all the way through. So that's gonna that's not even gonna cut next time. Until you get down past there. So you tell it somebody way up high, I'll pass these around. You tell it somebody way up high has gotten onto some harder metal. Um, with anything, you just wanna go down to the, the this is your most powerful cutting mm -hmm. point, not here. Uh, but once that gets damaged in there, you're not cutting anything anymore. You're going to pinch it all down to a small 
sixteenth-ish opening, and then it's going to stop because it's never going to make it all the way through. You guys can see that those don't even close all together anymore. They're still useful. We're still going to be able to get into things, but not not like we would. You see how that was pinch it almost all the way together, but just not close tight. Now, if you get all the way back to the uh, toward the uh, the actual mechanism is, mechanism is that opens it uh, to the, the smaller end. You can see that they're still together. That's the hardest cutting part that we have. You get the more advantage on that than you were anywhere else. Um, using a, a dull saw, you're going to use 10 times the effort. Uh, it's going to be a lot more dangerous to use that in there. And you're just not going to get anything out of that, the tool that the mechanization uh, the manufacturer suggests you're going to get out of it. Again, the damaged tools are using them for their for an improper use, using them on the wrong type of material, and uh, just not taking care of your tools at the end. Uh, we always clean and we always sharpen your tools. <coughs> safety, safety, safety. Um, so you select the right tool. Again, that's going to go with what your what your objective is. Are you trying to go through a metal door? Are you trying to go through a glass window? Are you trying to go through a concrete roof, uh, uh, a wood door, wood frame door, a metal door with wood frame? Um, what, what do you got? A fringe this way is going to let you know, give you a good idea on everything that you have going on in your district and what, what how your buildings are set up and what, what means of uh, interest you're going to have to use in those situations. Uh, use the tools for their intended purpose only. That, that's a serious statement, but then again, it, it, as firefighters, we know that we're going to find other ways to use tools, and during a testing process, you are only going to use those tools for their intended purpose, right? Because that's the manufacturer suggests. Uh, when you're using your tools, you want to have a good base, a good, uh, a good base. You want to have your, your, your body weight positioned where you're balanced equally on both feet, you're not leaning over one side, forward or backwards. Um, you don't want to be standing here like this, trying to uh, hit something or strike something over here. Everything's going to be nice and centered, balanced, and you're going to you're try to keep everything in line. Just like you would if you're picking up a patient. You want to keep everything in line, your spine and all that. Same thing with using tools. You have a lot of extra weight that's, that's being flung around or being pushed or being pulled. Um, with any other technique, it's with any other thing that you move, there's a technique to it. You don't want to you want to pick up a heavy box uh, with your back instead of your knees. You know what I mean? You got you want to keep all of your your structure that you have steady or uh, sturdy. So keep your center of balance going. <coughs> uh, maintain a uh, a clear workspace. You don't want to have a bunch of debris sitting on the ground as you're going to trip and fall over. Uh, your partner's going to trip and fall over you're trying to help you out or whatever. Just clean your area, position your weight over there, try to be safe about all this stuff. Trust your tools. They're going to do the job. They really are. Preventing injuries when using tools. Again, make sure you have the room to operate the tool properly. You don't, you don't want to be operating a tool, anything really, in a congested area. That's just trip hazards, fall hazards, snag hazards. All that stuff. Um, be aware of the sudden release of energy when a door or, or wall is open. Uh, it, you could have um, environmental issues. There could be wind at your back. So as soon as you make entry into that, that doorway or that window or whatever, and again, the environmental issues, there's wind at your back, you're forcing air into that fire as opposed to letting air in the fire, which is why, again, you're going to want to control the door or whatever opening that you have to maintain, uh, to maintain con uh, control over the actual oxygen and air that you're allowing in there. Every opening is a ventilation. Uh, every ventilation helps feed the fire. Ensure other personnel are out of the immediate area. You're not going to want to fire up your torch with somebody standing on the other side of whatever you're torching on. You're not going to want to swing a, a sledge or anything like that with somebody standing right next to you or right behind you. It, don't stand in the batter's box when somebody's batting, right? Um, let's be aware of the environment to prevent gas or vapor igniters, uh, ignition. 
So that's going to go along with your the conditions in the room or the area that you're in. Is it well ventilated? Are there extra gases in there that don't need to be in there? We need to clear those out, or do we need to be in a different area to actually do our, our job? Uh, I never had it done, I've never seen it done, but I've heard lots of horror stories about people making a uh, people making doing an operation and having it backfire and having themselves be part of the next operation. Nobody ever wants to do that. Everybody hates seeing stories like that, but it does happen. So just be aware of the environment, particularly gas and vapor ignition and other hazards that are laying around and people that are around you that could pose dangers. <clears throat> tool safety. Become familiar with all the tools you will use. That's that's playing around with tools in between calls. I see you guys do this. You do it all the time. Opening compartments, pulling shit out, pulling stuff out, and messing with it. Um, knowing your tools and what they're capable of, and what you're capable of doing with that tool. I, I can't work a a ten pound sledge as good as say you can. It's just I don't. I'm not physically capable of doing that. I know how to do it. I, I know what's going to result from it, but I'm not physically able to do it. Know your limitations, just like you know the tools limitations. You can keep tools in properly designed places. In our truck, each of our compartments are designed a certain way so that we have certain tools in them. We have our extrication compartment and they're all fastened in there in a certain way so everything's in its exact spot. You don't want to go, everybody's grandpa's toolbox looks the same. You open it up and it's got wrenches, screwdrivers, nail pullers, everything. You just got to dig around until you find it. That is not time consuming. That's not feasible on an emergency situation at all. Everything needs to have a designated place. We put that stuff back. That's going to give you muscle memory of going back to that same spot each time and knowing that that tool is there. Uh, make sure the tools are secured. Again, in that in each other's spots, we have a either a strap that goes over them or a harness that they set in or a bag that we keep them in. Um, any tool on your on your apparatus during a wreck becomes a flying projectile. So everything needs to be secured, everything needs to be locked in, and no, everything needs to be locked in and secured, uh, safety of the people that are in that apparatus and around it. Once again, we repair or replace damaged tools <coughs> immediately. You chip the ends of this off, it's no longer a, a decent thickhead axe. Now you've got a paperweight that looks like it used to be a thickhead axe. This is, you're never going to be able to use this for anything else with that busted off. But this is as smooth as a spoon. You're never going to be able to penetrate anything with it. Very deep tech to get cuts in there. But that being said, if it's as sharp as a razor blade, you're never going to get it out of that chunk of wood you stuck it into because of all the extra weight behind it, all the extra leather that you need to kick it in there. Refer to your manufacturer. They know how these tools should be sharpened and the, and the uh, condition they should be in. Right. Always clean your tools. When you clean your tools, you'll notice different markings, mars, uh, damage to it on the next use. Well, I just cleaned that. Oh, as I'm cleaning that, I realized that there's a big crack in my handle. As I, as I was repairing this, I realized that I'm not going to be able to get all that in there to repair it. It's damaged. Let's get rid of it. Take it out of service. Don't put the next crew at jeopardy by saying, ah, it's probably good. Um, if you notice it, say something. Replace it or repair it. Do not strike the tool's handle. That's going to go along with every tool is designed to do something. Every part of that tool is designed to do something. <coughs> this handle is designed to be a handle. Not a pry bar, not a, a striking tool, not a, well, I guess it could be kind of pushing tool. You could push something out of the way with it, but you never strike anything with your handle. Your, the damage you cause to your handle is going to go a long ways when it comes to the stability of your tool, the safety of your tool. The handle, it's in the name, it's a handle. Only is it a, a hold. Don't use a prying tool as a striking tool unless designed to do so. So, this is a prying tool. This is a prying tool. No matter which way you look at it, which way you hold it, it is a prying tool. Until you hold it like this, and you have your flat head design right there, it's actually now a striking, a striking tool. This isn't 
This isn't you're going to be your first choice as a striking tool. This is a last resort striking tool. Um, but technically with that flat end back there and the damage done to it, you can see we've already used it as a striking tool. 